Good afternoon. Hello? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I'm very happy to welcome you to uh, this panel of the Fragility Forum, which is called Programmatic Engagement in Politically Estranged Settings, Opportunities and Risks. Now, we've already heard from several speakers this morning, starting with the managing director here at the World Bank, uh, Anna Bierde, that when it comes to fragile and conflict affected uh, settings, we need to stay engaged. And that despite the complexities and the difficulties that we, we encounter in the FCD settings, there is no alternative to continuing to work in those, in those settings. But there's a subset of those FCV countries that um, re represent, and this is a term that I think uh, Sarah on the end may have coined, uh, there's a subset of those countries and a growing subset, unfortunately, uh, that we can call uh, politically estranged settings. This comes from a study that uh, the NYU New York University together with Chatham House uh, did last year in which they were looking at countries uh, that are in situations where the relations between the national authorities and major international donors have been suspended or curtailed. So that is what they are uh, calling politically, very euphemistically, I would say, but nonetheless politically estranged uh, settings. So I think this is a very important lens that we need to look through uh, because according to the research, and Sarah, you will correct me if I'm wrong on this, about half of all of the FCV countries are in this politically estranged basket. In other words, the, uh, the authorities of the moment, the national authorities have uh, difficult or estranged relations with the international community and in particular with major international donors. And what that means is that the people of those countries uh, are therefore potentially even in greater peril in terms of being able to get the support uh, that they need. Now, what places are we talking about? There are a number of them across the world. I can mention uh, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan, and in the Sahel in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger. Now, many of these contexts arise out of uh, violent takeovers or military coups, uh, but of course, each context, each country is different in its own ways. I would just like to conclude these first uh, brief remarks by saying that I think we can agree, as Anna and others said this morning, that we need to stay engaged in FCD countries, including in these countries that are politically estranged. But the tricky question, the most difficult question, is how do we do that? And this is what I'm sure our panelists will be helping us to uh, delve into. And I'm very pleased to start by introducing very quickly all five of our panelists. We have a, a terrific set of experts here with us. Um, and let me start with my immediate left, uh, my good friend, Her Excellency Fatima Kiari Mohammed. Uh, she is the permanent observer of the African Union to the United Nations. Uh, to her left, we have my dear colleague, Assistant Secretary General Al Dardari. Al you may have heard him earlier this morning. He was on another panel. He is the head of uh, UNDP's Regional Bureau for Arab States. Uh, and then we have uh, joining us online, I hope that is set up, uh, Mariam Safi. Uh, Mariam is the founding executive. Uh, director of DROPS, an Afghan NGO. And then uh, finally, last, oh, pardon me, then we have uh, Maimuna Tham uh, to uh, my colleague's uh, left, who is a world group manager for, World Bank group manager for FCV. Thank you so much, Maimuna, for joining us. And then finally, we have Dr. Sarah Cliff at the very end of the chain, uh, director of the Center for International Cooperation at New York University, and uh, is a co-author of uh, the study that I mentioned a few moments ago on staying engaged in politically exchanged contexts. So without further ado, I'd just like to say to each of the panelists that um, we only have one hour. So I would like uh, everyone to keep to around five minutes max. That would give us time to turn to the audience, uh, both 
you here in the room and also online for any questions or comments. And then I hope to have time at the end to come back to each of the panelists with uh, one or two minutes of, uh, of concluding thoughts. So without further ado, I would like to turn to my immediate left again and ask a question of uh, Ambassador Fatima Mohammed. Um, Ambassador, you've just returned from the African Union Summit uh, in Addis Ababa. The African Union, Union has long been firm in its zero toler tolerance approach to coups. Thinking about the latest examples uh, in the, on the continent, as well as the desperate needs in the Sahel and Sudan, what do you see as the role of development and peacebuilding actors? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And it's an honor for me uh, to be here, uh, to join you and to share some perspectives uh, from the African Union. Um, let me start by saying that the nature of conflict in Africa as a whole has um, changed exponentially since um, the Cold War. And this has had an impact, of course, on uh, the general discourse and initiatives um, taken by particularly African institutions in the area of peace, security, development and, and, and peace building, of course. And um, we are all aware, as you correctly said, that a number of um, African states face political instability, including undemocratic changes uh, of power, um, terrorism that is at an unprecedented uh, scale. And um, this is not only alarming, but it's also um, spreading uh, at a rate that has um, further uh, risks in terms of destabilizing uh, other parts of the continent, but also other regions outside of Africa. And of course, an additional layer is the high levels of poverty, uh, weak state institutions that um, fail to provide basic needs uh, for populations. And of course, this is further aggravated by a number of challenges such as um, climate change and of course, global dynamics. Um, and what I uh, like to call the external three eyes, uh, which are influence, uh, interference, and interests, which tend to feed into this perpetual uh, vicious cycle. So this not only puts a very, um, I would say, um, dark cloud over the phenomenal things that are actually happening um, uh, in Africa in terms of innovation, technology, culture, arts. I mean, I'm sure I can ask with a raise of hands how many of you don't know a Nigerian song or haven't seen a Nigerian movie or a West or um, a, an East African sitcom or, you know, South African, um, um, I haven't watched like South African sports. You know, it's it's just phenomenal. But unfortunately, whenever you speak about Africa, it's always about poverty, disease, and everything that is uh, negative. And this is a consequence of what is um, currently um, happening. So therefore, the belief is that we can't really achieve our goals and our aspirations uh, for the continent when we're constantly diverting our resources and, resources and are distracted by instability, which is driven by the factors that I mentioned earlier. Um, in addition to that, I must say that we cannot move away from the fact that we do live in an interconnected world and um, we are independent, um, interdependent of each other. And this is more so true um, within uh, the African continent. So intrastate conflict um, obviously has significant regional dimensions. And we are definitely experiencing this in the Sahel, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, but also uh, the Horn of, Horn of Africa and other um, parts of the continent. So with that said, um, I think it's very important for me to mention perhaps the background in terms of institu institutional arrangements that exist. You mentioned the summit that just um, concluded in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, which I just came from. But the background of the AU itself, as you're aware, um, came from the decision uh, a couple of decades ago um, by African um, leaders to basically move away uh, from, you know, this um, position of non-indifference, uh, non-interference to non-indifference and to focus more on developing Africa um, and move away from um, 
the scourge uh, of, of conflict. We do have in place a number of institutional frameworks that exist, including our Agenda 2063, which is focused on um, development, but also the various aspects of the African peace and security architecture, which also focus on um, addressing uh, the challenges. Now, um, all that to say basically that as an institution, member states have made it clear that these instruments need uh, to focus on building the continent and need to address conflict at the root, including the rejection of unconstitutional changes of government. And this is why political sanctions are triggered when these circumstances occur following decisions that are taken at the highest level. Now, putting a spotlight on the issue of um, fragility and the relations, particularly where it comes to um, uh, major donors and how we can uh, address um, some of this. I think it's an issue that clearly creates a dilemma between how decisions in certain fragile contexts may impact leadership, which on the one hand may or may not be considered legitimate, and the populations on the other hand, which in most cases um, are the ones that suffer the impact of these decisions, but at the same time support these um, governments that are that are in place. Um, we find ourselves in, in a dilemma in terms of looking at what the model currently is and whether the model actually works uh, for many of these um, countries. So this particular session to give you a very concrete example is happening just a few days after the ECOWAS um, extraordinary um, summit. You mentioned the Sahel. Um, the countries within the Sahel are part of um, the sub-regional organization. And there's been um, a backlash um, in terms of, um, and this is unprecedented, right? Because we have uh, four countries in that region that are con currently under unconstitutional changes of government. And um, they are under sanction, but there's also a re realization by the leaders of the sub-region that these sanctions have had uh, a negative impact on the population uh, within the region. So it's clear that these kind of punitive measures, on the one hand, force to force armed groups or coup leaders um, to dialogue and to um, facilitate uh, democratic transitions may not necessarily work because it's at the detriment of the populations. And that's why ECOWAS leaders now reconsidered the sanctions on these countries and have lifted certain economic um, uh, sanctions. Um, now, this further creates obviously challenges, particularly for multilateral organizations. Um, international partners um, find themselves in a situation where they, on the one hand, have to maintain political dialogue um, and resolve conflicts, but also have to continue to provide life-saving needs for vulnerable populations and also have to continue at the same time promote democratic ideals. So how do we do that and ensure that we transition to actually um, democratically led, civilian led um, governments? I think another point of consideration, and I'll try to be fast here, um, is when uh, we have situations of a constitutional changes of um, government, um, and I mentioned, I touched upon this earlier, um, but have the support of um, uh, the general uh, population. The question is, does this somehow legitimize those who have seized power? And if this is now sending a signal that if a civilian led government is not able to provide basic security and the basic needs of its population, then there may be something wrong with the model and we may have to um, review it, perhaps rebooting like we do our phones, I'm not sure. But I would posit that we do not only need to review these circumstances on a case by case basis, but also find a way to ensure that we do not legitimize what is not legitimate by any standard. And the last point I'll make um, is that as a whole, I think the reality is we are currently living in a very polarized international system. Um, and unfortunately, this somehow offers alternatives to conflict parties and military regimes. It enables them to resist sanctions to a certain extent. And um, it's changing the way 
we do business the way we previously used to instill pressure on certain countries. And um, they're finding ways uh, to no longer be isolated from the international community. And therefore, the focus needs to be directed at, first of all, preventing, I think, the breakdown of the social contract between existing governments and their populations. But in addition to that, ensuring that there's some sort of efficiency and efficacy of sanctions that are imposed on countries and suspension of member states, um, particularly when it comes to regional blocks and um, um, broader continental um, institutions. Um, with that, maybe I'll just stop here. I know we're running out of time and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. You've also raised uh, even more questions than we'll probably have time to answer, but very, very pertinent. Um, this point about the, the fact that uh, in some of these cases, um, the change, the unconstitutional change, the overthrow uh, has actually been quite popular with the population, does throw up a number of, of dilemmas. And as you mentioned several times, it makes us perhaps question the model, as you said, the model of government, the, the system, or if not the system itself, but how actually it is responding or not to the needs of the people. So clearly there's, there's something there that we, um, we need to dig into further. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Let me go now to your uh, neighbor to the left, uh, ASG uh, Al Dardari. Uh, the question for you, uh, dear colleague, so you have lived and breathed literally the development challenges in a number of politically challenged, politically estranged contexts for many years. So we want to ask you, what is your advice uh, to UN teams that are trying to navigate the challenges after a coup or a violent takeover, uh, including how do they deal with donor concerns? What do you see as good practices? Over to you. That's it. That's the question. You were That's it. <laughs> I, I, I can come up with a third one if you like. But no, no. no please don't. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say a few words on Africa, if you don't mind. Africa is maturing, has matured and going beyond the political, the post-colonial political economy construct. It was trapped in since independence. Africa is moving forward for a number of reasons. First of all, because Africa is realizing that the aid system and the development finance system of the post-World War II has failed it and kept it as a, an exporter of raw material, mainly. Secondly, at the moment, the numbers are very clear. The total aid to Africa every year does not exceed $40 billion, but Africa investment in development in Africa is more than $780 billion. So Africans are actually funding their development. In fact, we have a new phenomenon now, the DRC, for example, you may know that, uh, has only, or just given UNDP $650 million to launch a massive rural community development program. Now, DRC on our list of donors is number seven. These are things that are happening because okay, they borrowed from different IFIs and they are investing in their development the way they want. So another number I'd like to set here is to, to set in the scene, uh, we have between Sahel and North Africa, we have today 200 million people under the age of 16. And they will need jobs in the next four to five years. They need education and they need jobs. The current political economy of aid and the current political economy of development in Africa will never create 200 million jobs for those people. So Africa is feeling this need for change. Now, that expression of the need of, for change is taking sometimes what we call illegitimate takeover of power by military groups and so on, but who are, for now at least, proving to be popular with the people. And that's a tremendous challenge for all of us. I was in Kabul, and I know Ms. Safi is here. She knows much more than I do about Afghanistan, but I was in Kabul when Taliban took over. They knocked on our compound gate, and I had to go out and talk to them. And 
we decided we are staying in the liver. We are not going anywhere. Fine, we do not recognize Taliban. But under Taliban, as I said in session one this morning, we created one million jobs through livelihood projects. We supported 70,000 women-owned enterprises who are now the backbone of local economies in Afghanistan. And ironically, the Afghan currency in 2023 was the best performing currency in the world. Dollar was 90-something Afghanis. Now it is 60-something Afghanis. Now, I'm not praising Taliban, but I think the international community brought some realism to its thinking about what do we do in Afghanistan now and decided we cannot stop. We cannot just give food baskets. That, and now the money for food baskets has, has almost dried up. So thank God we created the 1 million jobs. Thank God we have 70,000 companies that are now self-reliant and they are selling and now they, are, they have exhibitions in Dubai for Afghan women's products and so on. So, and we brought in cash to Afghanistan almost $3 billion. U.S. Treasury approved cash shipments to Afghanistan and that's what sustained the currency and brought back the banking system, which was at the brink of collapse with all the people's savings with it, uh, the banking system survived. And now we are reviving microfinance institutions. So we need to ask ourselves, and I'll close with this point. We need to ask ourselves, what is legitimacy? To create jobs for 200 million people or to stick to the form? Because the form at the moment does not match the needs. So the, the word legitimacy, as we all know it, and as Sarah has so eloquently detailed in her book, the word legitimacy is a post-Second World War construct. And Africa is growing out of that as a foreign observer, of course. So, uh, and I think for me personally, as a development practitioner for the last 38 years, this is the most exciting event you know, tectonic shift in global politics that we see now is what's happening in Africa. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think you've really spoken to the overall theme of the forum, adapting and innovating in, an, in a volatile world. So I'm going to quote you back to yourself. The forum does not ma match the needs and that we need to bring realism to our thinking in terms of what is it that we're actually trying to do? What are we trying to be supportive of? And we know that there are people in need in those countries and we can either uh, adapt our approaches and continue to do what we um, uh, have been set up to do um, or else we'll probably be failing on all fronts. So thank you for that. And also maybe... Uh, raise your point of the um, what some call the youth bulge of, uh, of Africa, which I think uh, many hope could be uh, a youth dividend as well, but it does depend on how we are all able to deliver for those young people. So thank you for that. Uh, now I'd like to go over to our screen and our online uh, participant, uh, Mariam Safi. So Mariam, you lead an organization that promotes pluralism and inclusiveness in Afghanistan and which has continued to operate since the Taliban takeover. Could you please tell us about your perspective on the risks and the challenges of operating in the current context in Afghanistan? And could you also tell us what you feel are the most important things that you need from international partners? Over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your question. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to extend my salam greetings and a good afternoon to my respected panelists and audience who have joined us today. Following from the conversation uh, that you just had uh, earlier about uh, bringing realism to our thinking, um, I agree. I think it's important that we do. And in light of that realism, I'd like to also draw a few uh perspectives from inside of Afghanistan on what civil society organizations are facing. 
And that uh, image, which I will paint to you, is uh, not one that uh, that uh, inspires a lot of positivity uh, since the fall of the Republic, what we have seen in Afghanistan is a dramatic shift and a shrinking of space for civil society organizations to operate, particularly those organizations that work on human rights, women's rights, monitoring, uh, capacity building with relation uh, to those areas. Um, those who have been able to operate have shifted their focus drastically um, in, in areas that the Taliban would allow them to work in, which is humanitarian delivery and, uh, and a bit of programmatic work in the uh, health sector. Um, other than that, uh, after the fall, uh, what we noticed was um, not only an evacuation of uh, human rights defenders and activists and civil society actors, but also an evacuation of, uh, of, of a lot of major donors and a lot of INGOs that were working with, with many local partners. And uh, this le left a, a, a gaping hole. And uh, in this type of climate, um, Afghan civil society organizations had to very quickly uh, adapt uh, to, a, to a new reality where they did feel very much uh, left alone. And in addition to, to this change, uh, we also saw uh, uh, the Taliban calling for a lot of civil society organizations to re-register themselves. And this time re-registering themselves meant uh, disclosing a lot of the personal information of their staff and their localities and their programs, which then makes them open to, uh, to interference by the de facto authorities on what they can and cannot do. And lastly, the the various edicts that they have announced, the edicts where they have um, uh, placed on women's mobility, access to employment, uh, the closure of uh, education programs. Um, these edicts have had consequences on women-led civil society organizations to the extent that women-led civil so society organizations uh, cannot operate and have to put in a male representative as their directors. Now, there are some cases where this isn't the case, but those are very few and far in between. Um, and it's not the, 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 the correct depiction of the landscape of the country. Now, in terms of what are the greatest risks for civil society organizations operating in Afghanistan, there are many, but I want to just highlight three for you today. One is security. And once again, security, particularly for those organizations who decided to not register themselves with the de facto authorities and are working clandestinely. And the reason why they're doing that is because they didn't want to change their programs to focus predominantly on, on areas uh, related to humanitarian aid delivery. They wanted to keep their programs on empowerment, human rights and women's rights, and those related issues. Censorship. And third, judiciary restrictions. I wanted to initially say judiciary accountability, but I realized I was pulling out a, um, a term that is more suitable for donors but not fair uh, for civil society organizations operating in the country. How they get funds, how they spend funds has now been severely curtailed uh, in the country, both because of donor expectations and also uh, restrictions and security uh, threats uh, from the de facto authorities. Now in Afghanistan right now, it is not business as, as usual. And the biggest risks to NGOs arise when they are cornered into following donor frameworks for administrative uh, procedures, financial frameworks, reporting and accountability measures, which have not entirely changed to reflect the new political landscape, landscape in the country. They, they are still what they were during the Republic. And it makes it not only difficult for these organizations to follow, but when they're cornered into following them, they put themselves in severe risk. Now, civil society organizations are very much working in Afghanistan and on various issues. Once again, whether that is clandestinely or whether it's registered under the de facto authorities. However, since uh, 2021, they've been able to navigate this space 
because they've been hypervigilant and ultra flexible. They have been agile. The ones that have managed to survive and continue their work have been the ones that have adapted and have been flexible to change course and adjust when things shift quickly. And things have shifted quickly. And on a regular basis in Afghanistan, we don't know what the next edict would be. We don't know what the next restriction would be uh, from the de facto authorities. Now, I do want to caution you that there is this mindset that civil society is no longer operating or existing under these current conditions. And I want to be clear that that is not the case. There are CSOs inside the country holding down the fort. And there are CSOs who have been evacuated and have set up their operations outside of the country. At DROPS, uh, my organization, uh, we have been able to use technology to shape our approach and our access. And this has allowed us to continue uh, doing a lot of our work, uh, whether it be evidence-based data collection, training of youth, and our advocacy efforts. In many ways, this has worked well in our particular case um, because with initiatives uh, like Bishnau, which means listen in the local language, it has allowed us to, to not only gather the perspectives of thousands of women on a bi-monthly basis on issues that are affecting their lives um, in 26 provinces in the country, but then our presence outside of the country has also allowed us to advocate uh, this. And our operations would not have been possible uh, without the flexibility of our uh, donors. However, it's not just CSOs that have been able to navigate this space, but also in particular media organizations like Tolo and Ariana and Pajwak News, for example. They've been able to navigate these spaces, these spaces in, 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 in very interesting ways in their engagement with the de facto authorities, though there is a bit of censorship and you can see that, um, but it's nevertheless impressive because the conditions under which they're working are difficult. Now, others, uh, where the nature of their work was as such that they were not able to shift them, have had no option but to close uh, their operations. But there is no one size fits all that doesn't exist. And I think that going back to my earlier points about being able to adapt and being able and being flexible has played a huge role. Now, coming back to my messages in terms of uh, to the donor community and to those working on Afghanistan as a, as a way to navigate these spaces uh, in these difficult circumstances. Um, I would say one, and, and if I can be very clear, don't draw attention to civil society organizations you're working with. And that is at times difficult for some donors to do, but that puts them at risk. Second, continue to provide support for local NGOs. There are dozens of NGOs working across the country and being able to provide financial support to them will make sure that their work continues. Third, funding has to be made accessible. And I can't stress that enough. We have been lucky to have had that support from our donors, but making funding accessible will allow these NGOs to have the acquired budgets to carry out their work. And this is particularly important for those working under the radar. Fourth, programmatic expectations need to be flexible. Fifth, we need to reduce the administrative burden on civil society organizations. And lastly, ensure, ensure security training becomes a key component of the projects that you support for local organizations. I think we are in an important uh, and very critical stage uh, uh, in Afghanistan at this juncture, where I feel that if these recommendations were taken into consideration, what we might see happen in Afghanistan is a space where local civil society organizations take local ownership of their projects and of the work that they're doing. And this is something that we had been struggling for in the past 20 years. But in this current environment and climate, we're at a situation where uh, local civil society organizations who best know how to navigate these difficult challenges in their terrain can take that ownership and be able to um, localize and contextualize their programming. And I think that that could prove quite effective because it is proving effective uh, so far. Um, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. Um,
you've described very eloquently the the context in which you yourself, your organization, and many other, many other organizations, civil society organizations are operating in at the moment uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, you did mention that uh, the most successful among them are, and I quote you, uh, hypervigilant and ultra flexible. And I think you were asking the international community to uh, to mirror that that approach. So you gave us some very um, very clear um, guidance on uh, what you, your organization, are looking for in terms of international support. I think uh, a lot of people here in the room have been taking uh, note. Um, and I think that uh, what you ended on, which is the uh, the possibilities, despite all the difficulties right now, of so local civil society, as you called it, taking back ownership is uh, is very compelling. So thank you so much for joining us uh, from, from Afghanistan. Uh, let me now go over to Maimuna. Maimuna Pham, and uh, the question to you, Maimuna, would be as follows. The World Bank has radically changed its approach since 2020 in favor of sustaining support in crisis and is often doing this in partnership with the UN. Uh, a recent example is the Afghanistan 3.0 strategy that, as I understand it, was launched just this month. In Sudan, our teams are also working together on up-to-date analytics, which is very important. Building on this, what more do you think the bank and partners can do together now, especially in the Sahel context, to maximize our impact on development and to help support peaceful transition? Over to you, Maimuna. Thank you very much. Uh... So let me uh, just come back to this question of engaging with de facto government and, and, and build up on the risk mentioned. So I would like to say that engaging with de facto governments post school present many risks. And I would like to mention three major risks. Uh, first is the risk of uh, giving the wrong signal that the rule of law is not fundamental. Third is the reputational risk of collaborating with uh, institutional, uh, with um, um, uh, regimes that may not respect human rights. And third is the risk of inaction, which is, in my view, the most important. And we need to remain engaged to be able to uh, continue to support, to uh, avoid uncertainty, to avoid spillover effect, and to also uh, avoid impact, negative impact on the economic growth and, and development effort. And this is where the partnership also comes in and the work we are doing together to make sure that we remain engaged in a, in, a, in, a, in a more comprehensive way. Remaining engaged doesn't mean that we will do business as usual, because what we are seeing on the ground will help us to focus on uh, people-centered uh, approaches that may help to protect human capital, that may help to uh, have interventions that will uh, benefit from the most vulnerable uh, people. And we cannot do it alone. So we need to uh, partner. And we have many examples in West Africa where we leverage on the UN agencies to uh, deliver quick win while we are building the country system, helping to, to, to uh, allow the uh, uh, country to be able to, to have a very pre positive presence of the state and deliver basic services in a more sustainable way. So engaging uh, with de facto governments is risky, but based on our uh, FCV strategy, uh, remaining engaged is a core principle and it's what we are trying to do. Uh, I, I, now, what have we learned so far by doing this? I would say three things. First, humility. Second, the need to adapt our approach in a very volatile and, and uncertain environment. And third, the need to revisit our delivery model. 
humility, it has already been mentioned. We need to learn to adapt to test and to be able to revisit the way we are engaging in, in, in with de facto governments. And we need also to recognize that this uh, some we need to recognize uh, that some uh, uh, elements are outside our influence. We cannot influence on what's going on. And it brings me also to this, the fact that we need to admit that this uh, uh, institutional uh, or uh, unconstitutional uh, changes are inherently political and require political solutions. Yet many underlying factors are core to the work we are doing together. For instance, the erosion of the social contract due to the government ineffectiveness to deliver basic services uh, to citizens, to protect citizens in a, many, in, a, in a very inclusive manner, weak governance system characterized by elite capture, vested interests, and a very low public service performance with high level corruption, and the youth unemployment, which is a time bomb if nothing is done in the coming years in Africa, and growing in. And all these causes. Uh, you don't, do you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes. And all these causes uh, justify the public support that we are seeing with these de facto regimes. And these elements should be. Uh, address equally regardless of the legitimacy or not of the government. It will bring also the need, even with constitutional uh, governments, to also put pressure to make sure that these uh, regimes are here for their citizens. So I mentioned the fact that humility we need to learn by doing and to recognize that we do not have solution in all all problems. The second is to adapt our approach in a, in a, in a very uh, volatile and uncertain environment. Uh, all core development challenges, investing in energy, health, education are still very relevant and we still have comparative advantages to do so, but we need to revisit our approaches. Uh, we are seeing in the Sahel, for instance, that the special approaches, community-driven community approaches, or building on programming, regional program, are proving valuable in a context where we need to focus on some hotspot at risk area and also uh, border regions. And my last point is revisiting our delivery model. Our delivery model is too slow in a context where we need the rapid result, where we need the impact to shift uh, and, and reverse the trend. So it's where we need to be more agile and flexible and leveraging on partnership. I, uh, going forward, being able to revisit our implementation modalities including more flexibilities and leveraging on, again on partnership, trying to see where we can be complementary, building on our comparative advantages and also provide being also investing or trying to address upfront the security risk, being able to bring together, as it was mentioned this morning, this nexus, uh, security, peace, and development together, and not just doing them by silo, will help us to, to come up with more comprehensive solutions, recognizing that it's not an easy task, but we need to, to, to learn by doing. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, really some excellent points as well. I liked your, uh, your three key points about humility, needing humility, adaptability, and that we have to revisit our delivery uh, models. Uh, also, you started with the, the point of absolutely needing to have people-centered approaches, which I think we would all very much agree with. Um, so now over to uh, uh, Sarah. Sarah, I know you'll have to leave us soon, so hopefully you'll be at least uh, able to hear maybe one or two questions before you go. Uh, the question to you is, you and your colleagues, as I said earlier, coined the term polit politically estranged in your study last year, and you've continued to monitor how practice is evolving among international partners. 
how far how far does what you've heard today align with the research that you conducted? And do you see areas where partners could do better together? And partnership has been a, a light motive uh, throughout all of the speakers. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do you hear me? Yes. Well, so I'm just going to make five brief points. I know we're short on time, but Mamunia has just made my first point much easier by saying, in fact, almost exactly what I was going to say, which is that the key message of the study we did with Chatham House was that we need to stay engaged, but avoid business as usual. That is the, the key dilemma. And if I go back and look at that historically in Africa, for instance, as regards the bank or in other regions such as Latin America, if we go back 50 years, in fact, the multilateral development banks paid very little attention to this. So you had things like the coup d'etat, which overthrew the government of Salvador Allende in Chile, which was followed actually by an increase, quite a dramatic increase in financing from outside because of the Cold War dynamics that were, were currently going on. So we go back several decades, business as usual, or even sometimes rewards really was the, the pattern. And at that time, the African Union and other regional organizations would say, but look, the incentives you are giving here are all wrong when we are trying to engage politically. That was followed, though, by a period in which the bank largely disengaged, as did other multilateral development banks. And that also had huge costs. It meant that people were left without development benefits or opportunities. It meant that the cost of eventual re-engagement was much higher because institutional capacity and knowledge was, was lost. So that balance, I think, is absolutely core to what is, is needed uh, here. And that balance is very much in the bank's uh, fragility, conflict and violence strategy. The second point is the need to really be rooted in the local political economy while not being naive about the degree of influence, interference and interest, as Ambassador uh, Fatima said, are at play in these circumstances. So in the end, the most important thing, I believe, is to find development engagement which works within the local political economy to encourage a movement towards a political settlement over time, towards a stronger social contract. And that maintains public opinion, which is in support of what external actors are, are doing. But there is also a need for donors, and donors were a main audience of the study we did with Chatham House, for them to be able to sell to their own taxpayers, what are we doing in these circumstances? And for them to do that, they need to be able to show ways of mitigating some of the risks, corruption and human rights that Mamounia talked about, and benefits, avoiding leaving a geopolitical vacuum, avoiding costly spillovers, avoiding basically disengaging in a way that will make things worse over, uh, over time, and protecting local institutions and in how they, they do that engagement, as Mariam said. Uh, third point is that we do have, I think, quite good evidence on how development actors should be engaged. So firstly, that leaving humanitarians on their own to deal with everything is very costly and puts them in a position where they are facing challenges they were not designed to actually meet. Secondly, that development issues can be a good entry point for peace building. You often have a situation where you can discuss health uh, or educational issues. You cannot necessarily discuss direct uh, political issues for a period of, of time. And there are proven vehicles and options for engaging to make you use of local institutional capacity, community-driven civil society, technical ministries, without legitimizing the illegitimate, as was said earlier on by, uh, by Ambassador uh, Mohammed. There are, though, changes needed there, and I'll come to the last part of your question, um, Elizabeth. Um, more of a focus, perhaps, on issues we don't typically look at in these circumstances. Some of the questions to do with currency and macroeconomic management that Abdullah raised in the uh, situation of Afghanistan. Issues of access to justice, which often are ways which extremist movements find of building links into populations when they are not addressed by humanitarian or development actors, and much closer link between peace building actors and developmental actors. Because in the end, there is no exit from these situations without dialogue 
and political mediation or, or peace building uh, efforts. So my last point there is still on, on where we could strengthen efforts. I think what we see over the period of, of the last two or three years is the need for more prevention efforts. So we're at a situation where 50% of the population of fragile and conflict-affected states are in this situation. Those countries need assistance to come out of that situation, and we need to prevent that more fall into it. So that, I think, requires asking, why did the civilian governments fail? Why were some of the coups, as other speakers said, popular, at least in the short term, in public opinion? Why did security forces, many of whom were in close partnerships of training and exercises with regional or external to the region militaries, why did they feel it was acceptable to take this type of, of unconstitutional action? And then intensify political action between the actors represented here to help societies move out and to look at more upstream prevention in societies that are at risk of falling in the same direction. Many thanks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Saren. Thank you, thank you very much for bringing in the, the point on prevention. I won't say any more because otherwise we won't have any time for questions. I've been a not a very good time manager, but I've just so enjoyed listening to all of you. So let me open the floor. Um, I checked with my colleagues, nothing uh, online yet in terms of questions. Does anyone want to take the mic here in the middle and ask a question or make a comment uh, for our panelists? Yes, I see. Uh, okay, two gentlemen, just if you could go over to the mics, to the mic over there in the middle. Yeah, great. I'll try to squeeze both of you in uh, unless they kick us off the stage. All right. I do know I have to come here. It's very difficult now to ask the question. A lot of tension. Um, I was really uh, uh, impressed by uh, my very good friend Abdullah's statement. I'm originally from Afghanistan. And I was hoping that maybe Abdullah could help us understand where he gets the statistics because I'm straggling myself from here, helping a lot of people. And I think I would really appreciate if you provide some, some source for those statistics you presented because as I recall, more than half of the society is completely uh, eliminated. And then also maybe for the panel, you were talking about realism. I'm also a social scientist. Maybe when it comes to places like Afghanistan or other countries, we could think of humanism and pragmatism. And that way, maybe we can find common grounds. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Can we have the second question? And then we'll turn it back to the panel. Uh, Sarah did have to leave us. She uh, is going to, I think, uh, chair or be part of another session. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Moderator. It's a bit late. <laughs> Okay, I'm Mr. Baruti. I'm from DRC, but I'm based in Belgium, and I work in peace building and conflict prevention in all Africa, but I specialize in the Sahel region. I don't have questions, but some remark to Madam Ambassador to say that the, currently Africa Union is not working perfectly because we thought. We saw uh, this morning that every region have, has its, its specificity in, uh, on, uh, about fragility. There is a need to set up a strategic uh, center running by the, some African experts, academic and uh, civil servants to address African issues because the situation that we used to see uh, on the picture is not only the reality. And the current situation in Sudan could be avoided if we had this kind of a strategic center because I could, we could uh, give some signal before the crisis arises. The same for the Niger. And I will finish to say that in the situ conflict situation, what we used to see is not only uh, the reality on the ground, because there we will find people, girls inside, the women, they, they are enjoying their, themselves. Outside you see conflict, but in, inside there is business, you see, it's so 
we need to think about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have one question for ASG Aldardar, if you want to answer, and then over to Ambassador Mohammed. Great to see you. And uh, today is Afghanistan Day for me. I took a, a, an Uber and the driver was an Afghan. And we, I, I spent the 40 minutes driving here just passionately speaking about Afghanistan. And, you know, you all know about the Afghan bug. If you go to Afghanistan, you fell, fall in love with it and you have to go back because you cannot. That's it. You got the bug. So, first of all, the numbers I'm quoting are the numbers of UNDP projects. So I'm not talking macroeconomic figures or national statistics and so on. So I'm ready to provide you with all these, with all this data. But I must say something about Afghan data. They are not as bad as we, when I wanted to build a model, a CGE model for Afghanistan, I thought it's impossible. Well, what type of data sets we have in the country? Uh, but I found out that we have excellent micro and macro data and no time series because uh, is it, that's why we didn't go for a macroeconomic model. We went for the GE model. And uh, uh, it was 60% accurate. And for someone working in development planning, that's, that's a good order of magnitude. You are not going to get 100% accurate model anyway. So, uh, But I must say that the technical skills of the Afghan Statistical Bureau were, were impressive because... They are part of the last 20 years before Taliban took over. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Ambassador Mohammed, the question to you. And uh, if you want to say any final word, I think we're going to have to start wrapping up very soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and um, I'm not sure my brother from the DRC had a question. I think it was more of a comment. And my comment, my comment back to you is that there's no such thing as a perfect institution, right? The African Union is currently going through reforms. We're constantly recalibrating. Nothing is static. As we evolve, our institutions also have to evolve and adapt to the realities in order to address our challenges. The UN, our global institution, same thing. We're going through reforms, constantly recalibrating, and we constantly need to adapt. So I think really the focus should be about remaining engaged, but also, um, as Miriam said, and I really like that comment about um, humility, being able to listen, being able to adapt, to being able to readjust in order for us to actually uh, address uh, the root causes of many of these issues. And maybe the last point I'll make, Elizabeth, because I know uh, we're running out of time, is just to quickly appreciate um, Mariam, who's on the panel here with us. I think the comments that she made coming from civil society, and I really appreciate that perspective, you know, where you actually hear from people from the ground, that's where you're really able to understand what is really going on. We can sit in our offices across the world making policy decisions, but the reality of it is what is actually happening in, on the ground and those that are actually on the ground are the ones that can really tell you whether impact is actually being made or not. So um, I'll leave it there and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Maimuna, unless you want to uh, add anything very quickly, very, very quickly. Hello. Very quickly, uh, I just want to add that uh, we need to uh, strive the right balance between focusing on the most pressing needs inherent to the crisis while keeping the trajectory on the development side and being able to come up with more ambitious and transformative program building institutions that will help to exit out of fragility. The statu quo is no longer an option. Thank you very much. The status quo is no longer an option. Yes. Uh, Mariam, very quickly, if you want to add one final thought. Yes, I just wanted to say, going back to the, um, I really appreciated what um, our um, friend from Afghanistan mentioned in the audience. When we're talking about realism, and I can't tell you how many times uh, we are thrown this uh, this uh, this statement uh, from whether it's state members at the UN Security Council or whether it's from the donor community, that you have to be pragmatic in order to find ways to engage with the Taliban and make the best of the situation. And I think that this can be far from the reality in Afghanistan. A little bit of realism is in our surveys, which you can find online, 
at bishnow.com. They're all there for you to see. When we asked women what their priorities were, and we spoke to thousands, and when we asked them this question, we gave them the options of addressing poverty, development needs, addressing security, women's rights. And by far, the majority of our respondents always pick women's uh, priorities or always human rights and women's rights. Now, that shows to us that that is something they do not have. And so if we're talking about realism, that's as real as it gets. But what I do see in Afghanistan happen is when you're throwing the concept of let's be realist and pragmatic, you're not keeping in mind what it is that Afghans in Afghanistan are voicing to you. And that is that right now you have a gender apartheid taking place in the country. You have a scenario where half the population is imprisoned in their country. And you have the other half of the population, which is dead scared of saying what they want. And they have no way out. And so I would say we have to, in this pursuit of pragmatism and realism, listen to what the locals want and ensure that that is a part and parcel of our engagement with de facto authorities and our support for civil society actors on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam. I'm glad that you've, you've had the last word among the panelists. So I would just leave all of us with some of the key words that came out uh, in this panel. Remain engaged, but not business as usual. More prevention, adaptability, flexibility, people-centered. And I want to take back those final words of yours, Mariam. Listen to the locals. Thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists.